Welcome everybody. Thanks for taking time out of your very busy schedules to join us today. My name is Tim Baker and I'll be moderating today's webinar on behalf of our host, Be Mary Ur. The title of this presentation is Integrating PCT Testing to Expedite Therapy for ED and ICU Patients. On behalf of BioMarriere, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today to explore this topic. It's our pleasure to introduce the expert leading this session, Dr. Mark Alterman. Dr. Alterman is Director of the Medical ICU at John Peter Smith Hospital, a 430-bed Level 1 Trauma Center in Fort Worth, Texas. Dr. Alterman manages four full-time intensivists at the hospital, which is home to the country's largest family practice residency. He recently became Vice Chairman of the Department of Internal Medicine and is responsible for quality for the department. As the primary hospital within the Tarrant County region, the John Peter Smith ICU sees many indigent patients who are often very ill. Most of these patients enter the hospital through the emergency department. Using case studies, Dr. Altman will discuss integrating PCT testing between the emergency department and ICU in order to quickly assess the risk of sepsis in these patients and to accelerate therapy. This discussion is based on Dr. Altman's extensive clinical experience. Dr. Altman will spend the next 40 minutes exploring how PCT can be used to improve the diagnosis and treatment of patients with suspected sepsis and to help stratify risk for patients with sepsis. With that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Alterman. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be invited to do this session. I have a particular passion for sepsis in the ICU. Just a couple of points of disclosure. This is an industry-sponsored meeting. I don't think there's any CME credits for anybody, but more specifically from my standpoint, I'm required to say that I'm not here representing JPS Hospital District in any, any fashion or JPS Physician Group that I work for. Just as a little bit of background, I do work as a full-time intensive care unit physician, primarily in the medical ICU. We'll see a few surgical patients, but most of it's medical ICU. And the bottom line is sepsis is probably our number one major diagnosis that we have to deal with. There is an FDA claim for procalcitonin. I was unaware of this and started doing talks that lab tests need FDA approval also. But it's approved to use in conjunction with the rest of your clinical assessment and other basic laboratory findings to try to describe the risk assessment of a critically ill patient on their first 24 hours of ICU admission and will they continue to go to septic shock or severe sepsis. Goals for today are to discuss the use of biomarkers in general and procalcitonin in specific for the risk assessment of sepsis in patients that are ultimately destined for the intensive care unit level of care. There is additional data that talks about utilizing biomarkers and procalcitonin for ED decisions as far as whether you're going to send the patients home versus admit them. Some very good prospective data looking at whether or not you're going to give patients antibiotics when they come in, but I primarily want to concentrate on the emergency room ICU interaction and then look at some of the trending data there is for ICU patients once they get there. This is just a picture of the amino acid sequence of procalcitonin, and I think the takeaway message here is that it's a pro-hormone, and the darker blue in the center is calcitonin that gets cleaved in the C-cells of the thyroid gland to help you with calcium metabolism. So in the normal thyroid, the procalcitonin is produced as a pro-hormone, and the appropriate enzyme can cleave that, and then calcitonin can come out for calcium metabolism. But during bacterial infection specifically, multiple other organs are stimulated to produce procalcitonin. Specifically, by bacterial infections, you can see down here lower that viral infections and interferon gamma inhibit this production. But the point is, is that because these cells don't have the enzyme to cleave it, it comes out as a total protein sequence of procalcitonin. This is just a blot diagram of the normal scenario in healthy patients where procalcitonin is mostly produced in the thyroid and a little bit in the lung. And then during severe bacterial infection, essentially all the tissues of the body produce procalcitonin in its entire molecule. This is just a graphic showing the time course of procalcitonin compared to some of the other potential biomarkers. So you can see that interleukin-6, interleukin-10, tumor necrosis fractor often rise very quickly. One of the problems with them is, as far as looking at them for biomarkers is they also decrease very, very rapidly. So depending on when the patients come in, they may have been missed. Procalcitonin begins to peak at about two to three hours and reaches its maximum at about 24 to 36 hours. And then if there's no longer any more major bacterial stimulation, it starts decreasing rapidly. That's in contradistinction to C-reactive protein that starts up a little bit later and then often stays elevated longer even though there's no more major bacterial stimulation. The nice thing about procalcitonin is that the higher levels tend to correlate with more severe infection. 
So just to kind of give you an idea of some of the numbers that we're discussing, normal is felt to be less than 0.05 for healthy individuals. Above 0.5 is felt to be abnormal. And then the higher it goes, the more likely they have severe sepsis and septic shock. When we look at some of the literature, some of the numbers that are being utilized is right around one nanograms per milliliter. So if you sort of remember that number, that's sort of some of the cutoffs when looking at the literature for severe infection. So this is an article that John Marshall published in 2009, and he presented some of this at the last critical care meeting in January, but talking about biomarkers in general for sepsis. And although he touched on procalcitonin and others, this was not a talk specifically about procalcitonin. But one of his comments were that, number one, biomarkers are very commonly used in other diseases. We're used to using them. We're supposed to be using them for clinical decision-making in many clinical institutions and situations. So we use D-dimer. We'll utilize BNP, cardiac enzymes, et cetera. The other issue is that diagnosis of sepsis is very nonspecific. So as you know, the definition basically is at least two SERS criteria and suspect infection. And especially in the medical intensive care unit, infection being one of our most common diagnoses, it makes it very, very hard to distinguish those who have SERS from infection versus not. So you guys are familiar with the four SERS criteria that can be very nonspecific. And then the other issue is that clinically we're not very good at making the diagnosis of sepsis, and I'm going to show you some of that data. One of the other points is sepsis is one of our most treatable diseases. And when I say treatable, one of the things I'm talking about is the fact that if we do it well, if we do optimal care, there's a huge difference in outcome of patients as opposed if we're a little bit on the sloppy side and don't do it as well as we should. So some of their other comments about biomarkers is that it's an objective test, so it's not left to physician discretion in helping to find a normal homeostasis or whether the patient's improving. That gives us a reference where when patients are abnormal or is there some pathologic process going along or is the patient worse today. And the idea is that it has this objective lab test and gives as the capacity to add timely information that's not readily available from routine physiologic data that you're getting down in the emergency room or from your clinical exam. Now, I think it's important to note, though, is that biomarkers or monitors in of themselves don't change outcome. There has to be a change in therapy that's going to be tied to whatever monitor you use, biomarker or whatever, in order to improve outcome with patients. So we need to keep that in mind that it's not the biomarker itself, it's the biomarker has caused an alteration in your therapy. So they looked at a number of different biomarkers. There's over 100 of them that have been looked at, proposed, and studied to help us in sepsis. Many of them are the normal or the adaptive response to sepsis, so interleukins, et cetera. CRP probably has been most used widely to date, but I think procalcitonin is getting in better data. So one of the questions asked to me just last month is, well, do we really need another biomarker that's just going to be abused? You know, it's just one of those that gets ordered all the time. And uh, to be honest, I, I think procalcitonin is not likely to necessarily replace other lab tests. Now, maybe you could use it to replace C-reactor protein, but I'm going to try to show you some data that I think that's still helpful to have both of them. Biomarkers are not intended to replace your thinking. They're supposed to supplement your thinking. So anytime we have a biomarker, we should be thinking in terms of a pretest probability of sepsis, and then we use a biomarker to help that, and we come up with a post-test probability of sepsis. I think thirdly, just because this test is abused doesn't mean it's a bad test. Finally, I think, again, how good are we clinically at making a diagnosis of sepsis? In other words, if we were already 95% at making a diagnosis of sepsis, maybe it's not very helpful. Well, this is a couple of articles that sort of talk about the current reliability of our ability to make sepsis diagnosis. So the first article from the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine in 2001 basically said that physicians are only correct about 77% of the time. And as more recently, we haven't gotten any better. So in, in this more recent article from 2010, physician judgment of sepsis was correct only 73% of the time. The question is, would you really buy a car that only started seven or eight times out of ten? If you guys have been listening to the Institute for Healthcare Improvement webinars lately, they've started the one on intensive care unit. Terry Clemmer gave an excellent introductory lecture talking about reliability in medicine. And his comment would always be, you know, would we fly on an airplane that two out of ten times crashed? So I think we have to see the need for biomarkers in this disease. So in the article by John Marshall, they described these five different areas for the potential use of biomarkers. And procalcitonin may or may not fit in any or all of these, but again, I think we want to go through them one by one and talk about the different possibilities. So the first one is screening, so identifying high-risk patients for early therapy but perceived low risk of sepsis. So patients that will be relatively sick and high risk for poor outcomes, but you're really thinking their primary diagnosis is something else. So I think the patients that come to mind in this area, we get one or two of these a month, 
A patient comes in, is unstable. They're thought to be a cardiac patient. Maybe they have a left bundle branch block that we don't know whether it's new or old. They get rushed off to the cath lab, and next thing you know, the coronaries are clean, and they come back, and what they really have is sepsis, and we're now three to four hours behind the eight ball as far as getting our therapy initiated. We've recently become a level one trauma center. So many unconscious patients come in, they'll have a head laceration, and so they'll go down the trauma pathway, and again, two, three, or more hours later, they don't find any trauma, they transfer the patient to the medicine side of the ICU, and then we find out, wow, this patient's really septic, and we've missed a number of hours. And then we get a number of OD patients, overdose patients that come in, and unfortunately, many of them don't leave suicide notes, so we're, a lot of these are all presumed overdose patients. And one of the questions is, well, should we be doing a lumbar puncture on these patients? Again, the idea if you had a good cheap test with 100% negative predictive value that ruled out sepsis allows you to work up in the other areas and not worry about it. So the second area was to diagnose either more reliably, more cheaply, or more quickly to make the correct diagnosis of sepsis. And I think one that always comes to mind by me is a diabetic ketoacidosis. So by definition, when patients come in with DKA, they're going to have at least two SARS criteria. They're all going to be breathing fast, and they're all going to have, have uh, relatively elevated heart rates. A lot of times, because you're breathing fast, you know, there was a study a number of years back that documented the temperature if taken orally in a patient who's tachypneic will be inappropriately low. So they could have fever, and you may not know it early on. We're always looking for the cause of DKA, so I think a biomarker such as procalcitonin would be a good quick screen to define whether or not these patients need to be looked at for sepsis. I think the other areas of shock patients that come in, they're hypotensive. And I tell the residents, you know, you've got about 10 to 15 minutes to try to decide what type of shock these patients are in. Is this cardiogenic shock, hypovolemic shock, et cetera? So I encourage them to utilize a number of biomarkers. So C-reactor protein, procalcitonin, you, got to, you have to look at the EKG quickly, cardiac enzymes, cortisol levels, et cetera. The point being, if sepsis is the diagnosis, then the timing of our antibiotics and getting early goal-directed therapy started early is critical. And then finally, we have a number of patients that are, quote, found down. Sometimes we joke around and say this is like our number one diagnosis in the medical ICU. Patients found down at home, nobody knows what's wrong with them, come in, get intubated in the ER, then they get sedated and chemically paralyzed, and by the time we get called to go see them, you know, we don't have a clue what's wrong with them. We don't, can't take a history anymore. There's no family. Very difficult to get a good physical exam, et cetera. So this is an article by Mueller looking at calcitonin precursors and making the diagnosis of sepsis in a medical intensive care unit. And this is an article from 2000. So the point was that, uh, again, similar to our own intensive care unit, 99% of the patients admitted to a medical ICU have two or more SERS criteria to begin with. And again, since infection is one of our most common medical ICU diagnoses, we we're, we're always want to make sure we don't miss that one. So they compared the usefulness of procalcitonin, CRT protein, interleukin-6, and lactate for the diagnosis of sepsis. So they looked at 101 patients that stayed for at least 24 hours. Now, ultimately, in their trial, 58% of the patients were found to be septic. So you can get an idea of sort of the prevalence of sepsis in this subset of patients. And these were the numbers. So the sensitivity for procalcitonin was 89%, specificity 94%, and those are the positive and negative predictive values and compared to the other ones. And when you look at this graphically, this is the receiver operating characteristic curve that you'll see a lot of these plotted out in literature today. But the idea is that if you had a straight diagonal line, then that test is completely unhelpful as far as when you make that diagnosis. On the other hand, a perfect curve would go straight up the sensitivity line and straight across uh, the specificity line. And so what they'll talk about is an area under the curve. So the percentage of the area under the curve, the better the test is. Now, I just want to go back briefly to the numbers here, sensitivity and specificity, because one of the other things that you'll hear about is a term called the positive likelihood ratio. And this is the sensitivity divided by one minus the specificity. And a lot of people talk about with tests that we do that we're looking for a, a positive likelihood ratio of greater than 10. And in this trial, the positive likelihood ratio was almost 15. The point is, if your pretest probabilities, we already said that this subset of patients, 58% of them were septic, with a positive likelihood ratio of 15, that brings your post-test analysis up to 95%. And again, that sort of correlates with the area under the curve of the procalcitonin curve. This is the second article that we referred to earlier, at Harbarth, and he looked at patients with SIRS and possible sepsis. So these were 78 SIRS patients, possible infection, and they looked at the diagnostic value of procalcitonin, interleukin-6, interleukin-8 on admission for patients. And the bottom line was the procalcitonin was the best. They used a cutoff. Remember, we talked about the numbers before, but the cutoff for them was 1.1 nanograms per milliliter, and that had a sensitivity of 97%, a specificity of 78%, and the error into the curve of 
Now, the interesting thing on this, as I referred to earlier, was that the clinical criteria, the physicians at the bedside trying to decide, is this patient septic or not septic, they were only correct 77% of the time. However, if you added procalcitonin to this, you can improve that to 94%, similar to the last study I talked about. So this is the rock curve for these three. So procalcitonin had the best curve compared to the other two. And then if you look at the area under the curve for the clinical diagnosis, it was only 77%. However, when you add to that the procalcitonin value, you can raise that up to 94%. And again, the point was interleukin-6 and interleukin-8 did not help in making this clinical diagnosis. This is the other article I referred to earlier, talking about our ability to clinically make the diagnosis of infection. But this is all, it came out in 2010. And these were all patients admitted to the, through the emergency room with a fever, and fever is defined as greater than or equal to 38 degrees. And at the end of the trial, a blinded panel defined whether or not the patients had infection or not. So of all these patients, if you look at the percentage, approximately 84% of the patients had infection. Now, again, the physician judgment was correct only 73% of the time. Now, ultimately, when you look at the article, they came out with a formula that utilized procalcitonin level, C-reactor protein level, and the presence of chills or not, that gave them the best data to define whether or not the patient had sepsis. But I think the really interesting thing, if you just look at the positive predictive value of procalcitonin greater than 0.7, just looking at that alone was 92%. So their conclusions for this is that procalcitonin was helpful. C-reactor protein was a little bit more sensitive. In other words, it had fewer false negatives. But procalcitonin was more specific. It had fewer false positives. So how important is it that we make a diagnosis of sepsis quickly? Well, procalcitonin is a lab test. It takes about 20 minutes to run. And I think when you look at that and get turnaround time, get the blood to the lab, get the results back, I think it's something that can give useful information within an hour. And is that important or not? Well, according to the data, it really is. This most recent article by Getsky from 2010 looked at retrospective analysis of emergency room patients that all met criteria for early goal-directed therapy. So if you remember the early goal-directed therapy criteria, it's all patients who are either hypotensive after their fluid bolus or they have lactate levels greater than four regardless of their blood pressure. Now, these, again, these are all patients that are thought to have infection. So look at 261 patients. About half of them qualify at triage when they first enter the emergency room, and the other half meet early goal-directed therapy criteria later on during their stay. Now, cryptic shock, that's basically meeting early goal-directed therapy criteria by lactate levels, not by blood pressure, is 48%. And it's, it's cryptic because the idea is that these patients don't necessarily look bad. And again, you're identifying these by lactate levels. Now, I don't know about some of the institutions. We can get our lactates back on a blood gas right now. But up until just a, a year or two ago, we actually had to get our lactates back from the major lab, and that often took longer than an hour. Now, I think one of the sad things that brought out in this study was almost 15% of the patients got inappropriate antibiotics, and I think we can do a better job there. But the point of this study was if you can get antibiotics started early, Okay, within one hour of meeting early goal-directed therapy criteria, you could have a major impact on overall clinical outcome. So the mortalities went from 33% down to 19.5%, 38% to 25% if you could get started at your antibiotics within an hour. And that's a 14% absolute reduction in mortality, which is huge. That, that's equal to a number needed to treat of only seven. So for every seven patients that we treat with antibiotics within the first hour, we can save one additional life by doing that. And that's huge when you compare that to other things that we do in medicine. For instance, if you look at patients coming in with ST elevation acute MI and whether or not they go to the cath lab or not, the number needed to treat there is probably 30 or 40. So there's a lot of potential here to save patients with sepsis if we do a good job, if we make a diagnosis early. So this was the third area that Dr. Marshall talked about, risk stratification. I know many of you utilize Zygris in certain scenarios, and we always discuss well, which patients are good candidates for Zygris and which ones are not. It's a drug that costs $7,000 for a course of therapy, so we shouldn't just use it willy-nilly. And I think the better the procalcitonin data looks, I think more likely we can use procalcitonin or other biomarkers in our protocol to help define who's going to get this expensive therapy or not. We were involved in the ACCESS trial. It's another one of the new sepsis drugs. This trial is not out in print yet. But I know when we talked with them and going through this, they were drawing their own procalcitonin levels for this trial in the hopes that at the end of all this, they would be able to define a level that would be more likely to benefit from their drug versus not. Lactate as a biomarker already triggers early goal-directed therapy, as I talked about, and maybe an elevated procalcitonin level should also. Higher levels may change admission decisions or intensify the monitoring decisions. So if you have a patient who looks pretty good, but their procalcitonin is very elevated, you may monitor that patient more closely in a telemetry ward as opposed to a regular ward. 
or it may increase the frequency of your vital sign checks, etc. The other thing is that persistently higher levels may prompt some discussions about limitations in care. And I know we always, if we have four different physicians and we all try to predict who's going to die and who's not, it's very, very difficult. But to have some more objective data that can tell you, boy, this patient's not doing very well, and it's not just my opinion, I have objective data to back that up, kind of gives us that confidence that we're not quitting too early. So this is an article that specifically looked at the prognostic information of procalcitonin on patients admitted with community-acquired pneumonia. So these patients are admitted through the emergency room with community-acquired pneumonia, and you can see that if their procalcitonin levels were greater than 0.1, they had a higher mortality than suppose it was less than 0.1. So the idea is that a procalcitonin less than 0.1 predicts a very, very low-risk population that could be dealt with maybe even as an outpatient or at least to a ward. The fourth area here was for monitoring to allow titration or modification of care if you're following on a daily basis or every other day. So if you're monitoring these patients utilizing procalcitonin, a major rise in procalcitonin may indicate new infection and can potentially improve the lead time to diagnose infection. So again, we've talked about how difficult it is to clinically make the diagnosis of infection, and so we potentially get lead time by a biomarker. On the other hand, if procalcitonin is improving, we're more likely to continue either the same course or even potentially de-escalate care. So as you know, in patients that have infections, 30% or more, we never actually diagnose an organism, so we don't know sensitivities. But if we know that the patient's improving, it may allow us to de-escalate to less broad-spectrum antibiotics. On the other hand, if it's not improving or even worsening, I think we have to at least consider an empiric change in our therapy or new diagnostic tests. And then the other issue is stopping antibiotics early for an early cure. Again, as you're monitoring, you're risk assessing these patients, there's good data now that says that even for ventilator-associated pneumonia patients, we can get by with just eight days of antibiotics if the patients are improving, but I think we need some objective evidence that patients are truly improving. So this is our typical ICU patient. They're hooked up to multiple machines. They're laying flat on their back. They're heavily sedated. We can't do a history on them. Our physical exam becomes much less reliable, and we're trying to assess this patient on a daily basis. Is their infection getting better? Is things getting worse? Do they have a new infection? And this is a typical curve that you can look at on patients that are in the intensive care unit and have infection. So the blue curve here, which shows patients that get started on appropriate antibiotics, and after three or, or so days, you'll see procalcitonin levels start to fall. And we've had other patients very similar to this that come in. We think they have a particular infection. We start them on the antibiotics, and we notice their procalcitonin is not improving. It's not improving. Next thing you know, we grow out pseudomonas, and we have not had them on anti-pseudomonal drugs. We switch antibiotics, and then we start seeing the procalcitonin level come down. Unfortunately, there are some patients that, in spite of being on good antibiotics, they may not improve, especially the immunosuppressed patients. We may know the infection, but we never get a handle on it, even with good antibiotics, because of their poor immune status. Another area in the intensive care unit is patients with fever, and of course I've been I've been following C-reactive protein levels for a number of years, and so we get these we struggle with these patients. Well, does this fever and high C-reactive protein level represent infection? So you can see that C-reactive protein does not really help distinguish those who have infection versus other inflammatory diseases or even malignant neoplasms. But procalcitonin does. Procalcitonin levels in the other inflammatory processes and malignant neoplasms, in, in general, it remains very low. And if they have infection, procalcitonin is elevated. So it helps you evaluate the patients with fever in your intensive care unit. And then finally, of the roles of biomarkers by Marshall, talked about a surrogate endpoint. So if we have a quick objective test that we know correlates with our ultimate endpoint of survival, then anything that we potentially do, we could titrate our care if that number improves. And it doesn't just have to be the treatment of infection, such as antibiotics and source control. It could be other therapies, such as nutrition therapy, physical therapy, ventilator management. The example I would give that's out there in the literature talks specifically about enteral nutrition versus parenteral clearly improves CRT protein levels in pancreatitis patients. And that improvement in serotonin protein correlated with improvement in their overall outcome. So what else is there in procalcitonin? There's a lot of articles. If you just pull up procalcitonin now and do a literature search, some of the areas that I think are important, one is differentiated infection, specifically pneumonia in patients that has ARDS. So patients already got a very, very abnormal chest X-ray, and you're trying to define, is this a new infiltrate or is this an old infiltrate, et cetera, it gets very difficult. And procalcitonin potentially can be helpful in making that decision. I know in my own experience, looking at patients that have prolonged ARDS, and so we want to start steroids for, quote, late ARDS in these patients. And it's got a particular risk. It's high-dose steroids that are very immunosuppressive. In my own experience, I feel like the patients that have relatively high C-reactor protein levels but low procalcitonin levels are the ones that seem to do the best. 
So it seems that the higher C reactive protein level correlates with a lot of inflammation, and that's why we're giving steroids as an anti-inflammatory agent. Yet at the same time, if you review that trial, it talks about how important it is to make sure that patients don't have ongoing infection before you start these high-dose steroids. Other articles out there talking about septic versus non-septic arthritis, utilizing serum procalcitonin levels. Neutropenic patients with fever, although I would caution many neutropenic patients are often infected with something besides bacteria, and procalcitonin is much more specific for bacteria. So just because you have a low procalcitonin level in a neutropenic patient doesn't mean that they need no therapy. It just means that the likelihood of bacterial infection would be relatively low. There was a conference, and then Dr. Gluck presented some data of his own. I've not seen it in print as of yet, but it's talking about using procalcitonin to improve the sensitivity and specificity of D-dimer for diagnosing pulmonary embolism. So one of the, of course, the big problems with D-dimer is when it's positive, there's multiple other areas that cause a positive D-dimer besides PE, and the most common cause would be infection. Essentially, everybody with major infection is going to have an elevated D-dimer level. So his data seemed to suggest that a very low procalcitonin level in the setting of a high D-dimer was much more specific for diagnosing pulmonary embolism. I've already mentioned steroids, high-dose steroids. Steroids do inhibit the C-reactor protein levels, and so in patients who are on high-dose steroids for whatever reason, procalcitonin can still be helpful to diagnose infection in those patients as opposed to following C-reactor protein. There's some data in children looking at viral versus bacterial meningitis utilizing procalcitonin to help you with that diagnosis. And then finally, if you do follow c protein levels, you have to remember that c protein is produced by the liver. It's an acute phase reactant that is produced in the liver, and patients with liver failure or major liver insufficiency, c protein becomes much less helpful as far as following to decide whether or not they have sepsis. So what about false positives? So procalcitonin release in the absence of infection. I don't deal with newborns, but apparently newborns that are within the first couple of days have uh, very high procalcitonin values, but they drop fairly rapidly in the first few days, and after that you could use the normal adult reference ranges. The primary inflammation issues caused by trauma, extensive burns, major surgery, often causes procalcitonin levels that are a little bit elevated, and when I talk about the levels, we're talking about levels kind of in that three to four range, so they're not very helpful in the first day or two as far as whether the patient has infection. However, if there's no new insult, those levels usually drop fairly rapidly within the first three days, and then you could follow them after that. It is of note that I think if you, if you look at some of the old trauma data, that 10% of trauma patients who are hypotensive, if you do blood cultures on them, 10% will have positive blood cultures. So it could be that there are actual bacteria or bacterial products that are causing these elevated procalcitonin levels, but they don't have classic infection, don't necessarily need a long-term antibiotics. I haven't dealt with any C-cell cancers or the thyroid, so I've not seen this one. But we do see the next one, the prolonged circulatory failure. So if we look at all of our patients that come in with cardiac arrest that we're giving hypothermia therapy to, many of these will have these mildly elevated procalcitonin levels in that two to four range for in the first few days. And again, I'm not sure exactly what to do with that. We typically start antibiotics early on just because of the data about how much improvement you can make with antibiotics if you miss infection. But we'll stop them quickly at day three if procalcitonin levels are dropping. And then finally, we did have a patient that was getting chemotherapy. It was one of these anti-lymphocyte issues, and she went into ARDS and went onto the ventilator and had very high procalcitonin levels, although we never documented infection. And then some of the false negatives to worry about, again, this is mostly specific for bacterial infections, so viral infections, fungal infections, parasitic infections typically don't have elevated procalcitonin levels. When we had our H1N1 outbreak, those notoriously had low procalcitonin levels. We still get occasionally an HIV patient that has a pneumocystis pneumonia, and they typically have low levels of procalcitonin. The other area would be local bacterial infection. So patient comes in with an ear infection that needs antibiotics. It's unlikely their procalcitonin level is going to be elevated of significance. could be very early in a severe bacterial infection. So if you caught a patient in the first few hours, right as their insult, you may not see an elevated procalcitonin level. But that's why one of the reasons they talk about in this, quote, first 24 hours is the trending of these patients. So just easy to repeat in the next few hours. And then finally, some of the subacute bacterial infections, a subacute bacterial endocarditis, We've had a couple of patients who have had strep viridans endocarditis. One of them was a patient who actually came in as a head bleed, and we weren't sure exactly what was going on. She had some low-grade fever. We went into some cultures, but everything looked good. Procalcitonin was relatively low. We didn't start antibiotics right away, and she ultimately got strep viridans and had endocarditis, and aortic valve endocarditis was the cause of her small head bleed.
And we had another patient that had long-term hydrocephalus that needed a ventricular peritoneal shunt. He had had repeated episodes of catheter-related meningitis. Uh, they finally brought him to the intensive care unit after taking his uh, catheter out and just had him drained at the bedside. And he finally eventually grew out serratia from his CSF, but it was a very low indolent infection, and his procalcitonin levels stayed relatively low. So what are my conclusions? I think sepsis is a severe issue in society today. It's getting worse. I think it's very treatable. In other words, if we do a good job versus if we sort of just do a so-so job, it's a huge difference in outcomes that we can make. I think our ability to clinically diagnose sepsis is very limited right now, and the data says it's not getting better, so uh, low in the 70% range. So I think we need to be thinking about biomarkers. If you, in 2010, I think procalcitonin is the best biomarker that's available. It's not necessarily the only biomarker, but if you look at what we could utilize today at the bedside, I think it's the forerunner. I think we do need to develop protocols on how we're going to respond to these things. In other words, again, it has to be tied to a therapy change. If you just draw the level and don't do anything about it, it's not going to change your therapy. And then following procalcitonin, the typical ICU patient can identify and give you an early trigger of an infectious process that may not have clinically presented as of yet.